Hey, welcome to uh, Kyle Meredith Live, seen Tuesdays and Thursdays right here on the Consequence of Sound Instagram, talking about uh, big issues, global hot topics, and, uh, and how they affect what we do here in the music industry. Today, I am so excited to be speaking with Liza Ann, who has a brand new record, an amazingly great new record called Bad Vacation. It is Thank so you. nice to, uh, to meet you on here. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. That's really nice of you to say. Well, I, I really do mean that. Uh, bad vacation. It, 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 you know, I don't, I don't know. It just arrived, and every single song that you led with all the teaser tracks, it's just sounded so refreshing. What you're doing, uh, I think you're an amazing oh. songwriter. And thank on, you. <laughs> well, on top of that, you're doing even. You're, you're going even further. I mean, doing way more than you know what you have to do, I guess, because. Uh, you know, one of the main things we're going to be talking about today is a series that you've been doing on your own Instagram called Emotional Health 2020. Uh, yeah. Let's start out with the basic questions. What exactly is this and what made you want to go in this direction and start this? Okay, one, this whole thing started. I'm going to show you this because this is literally where it started. So I love merch. It's like my favorite part of being a band. I think it's so funny. You can just put stuff stupid stuff on t-shirts and it says more than it should kind of thing but basically when we were going on tour with Lucy Dacus last year I was just kind of scrambling for a new t-shirt concept and I had this idea of just I mean even even last November just kind of the anxiety of leading up to this year of election and kind of as an artist being like how do I create a space where I'm forming and sharing my opinion politically, but also in a way that's um, unifying and not divisive. And so I put Emotional Health 2020 on a t-shirt and on pens. And I just basically was like, I feel like empathy is the center point of any form of growth. And so for me, my own music has been such a place where I've learned how to be soft with myself. But I think once you kind of are learning how to be soft with yourself, you're learning that that sort of softness translated outwards is the proof of the inner work. So I think I've just started this series because originally I wanted to go on tour and you know this year was supposed to be <laughs> not how it was for everybody and so I had plans to do these like emotional health rallies before shows where I connected people with um, things in their community that are either self-help oriented or knowledge about certain political things in their space. It's kind of like a combination of heart and politics. I guess. Right. But anyway, I had that goal and obviously this year has changed a lot. So I just decided to start hosting candid conversations with people that I love learning from um, in hopes that it kind of illuminates that for other people too. So yeah. And that's, I mean, first off, that's such an important thing to drive this conversation forward because, because this has been a part uh, I'm going to broadly say of rock and roll since the very beginning. It just wasn't named or it wasn't said out loud. And and I don't feel like uh, people have really started talking in earnest about mental health, about emotional health, uh, more in the last decade, but maybe even sooner than that, really in the last five years, has it really become a thing. The music industry, you spend so much of your life, if you're, if you're a musician, uh, in isolation one way or the yeah. other, you know, whether it's songwriting or whether it's in the waiting room, uh, the green room, you know, waiting for the show to go on. Yeah. What, I mean, your own experience with that, you know, you're, you're, you've kind of taken the broad approach with your, you know, what you were talking about there, just globally, what we're all going through right now. But, but has that been your own journey as well of trying to, to put a name on, on mental health for yourself? Oh, absolutely. I think, um, my last record before the one that I'm about to put out was so much about me just having that conversation with myself internally. And I think in order to really be someone who doesn't have stigma around mental and emotional health for other people, you have to sort of do that for yourself. And I feel like I was so quick to welcome other people's journeys in my life, but I didn't know how to hold my own self. Like I... I was so like, oh, everything, it's okay to not be okay to other people. But then my own experience with myself was nowhere near that level of forgiving and soft. And so I think just learning how to hold space for myself has just, yeah, 
I mean, that's the only way to give people a door into their own form of healing is sort of having that be a reality for yourself. So I think Fine But Dying sort of opened the door for me into making sure I was taking care of myself so that I could extend that to other people. And so you, you're giving that back as well now. I mean, the converse, it's now a conversation. You've been inviting uh, other artists onto your Instagram. What are you hearing from them? I mean, is there, is there, is there a, a part of this topic that, so, that, that seems to creep up more so than others? You know, that's a really, really good question. I think, let me think, because everyone, it really does feel like, the, the last question I end on, on emotional health rallies is, what have you learned about yourself this year that if the world didn't stop, you don't feel like you would have come across? And I think, especially in the artist community, what I've heard is they're learning to be with themselves outside of what they do. Because all like we do, like who we are is so connected to what we do, because what we do is this articulation and extension of who we are as people which is wonderful it's a great job but it also ends up you lose the connection to the personhood of just living and I think that this year has held this I mean there's grief and pain beyond in this year but there's also this time to connect to the humanness of yourself um, and it, which just feels really positive yeah, I'll actually quote you uh, from one of your more recent uh, emotional health rallies because, um, and I, I apologies, I forget which, which person you were talking to, but you said there's no option but to grow this year. And yeah. I thought that's a really interesting point because for so many reasons, but I, I'd like to hear exactly, you know, I have my take on that, but what were you getting at with that? Well, I think when you're kind of coming nose to nose with transition, there's like two forms of dealing with it. And I think one form is shutting down, clinching around the reality you don't want to let go of, and kind of you just stay where you are, which is fine. But I think in those moments, you're ignoring this amazing opportunity to sort of transcend your current level of consciousness, level of awareness of yourself, of other people. And I think in regards to 2020, what it would look like to just hold on to your own reality and really try not to change is potentially holding on to really harmful beliefs that are in a lot of ways objectifying and, and victimizing, you know, vulnerable groups of people. And I think that basically with all that's going on with the pandemic and the racial injustice and the, the complete change of pace from the modernity we all were used to is yeah you can hold on to the reality that we had before but i think that completely like it, it cuts in half or gets rid of completely the ability to to just grow and yeah. transcend and i think what's so interesting about this year is it's a collective growth we all are experiencing it together it's not just like one of us is going through grief and we all get to watch it. It's mm -hmm. like all of us have this opportunity to look around and expand our own awareness of our own self outside of what we do or outside of the comfort that we had and the pace of everything before. It's just, I think, I don't know if that answered your question, but I, I feel like we're just set up for I don't know, this is such a like generation Z term, but like a level up. Like I just yeah. feel it's setting us up to like, to just transcend where we were, which is cool. Right, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll echo that a little bit because that's, that's what I took from that. It's, you know, these movements have happened before and never seem to keep the traction to be part of our daily story, to be part of our daily conversation as they have now. And, and I do think, you know, um, one side, we were to the tipping point. We should have been to the tipping point a million years ago, but here we are and we're finally to the tipping point. But all we have time, we, I mean, we have just nothing but time for reflection, you know, uh, and I know that's been for me as well. I, I really appreciated you all kind of pointing that out in that way because, you know, it's one thing to know something, but then to understand why and yeah and i think that comes back to a lot of what you're doing on here it's you know we all know what's unhealthy in our lives and and yeah. but to finally put you know the the terminology on it right 
Yeah. Well, it's so easy to, I mean, emotional work and growth is, it's not easy. So it's so easy in life, I think before this year to be like, oh, I just don't have time. I just don't have, oh, I just don't, I don't want to deal with that right now. And I feel like in the first couple months of quarantine, I was like, oh, I have no excuse but to kind of face the skeletons in my emotional closet and and I think that's why this series has been so important to me personally is like I kind of have this touch base point once a week where I'm deciding to listen to someone else talk about how they've grown this year which is like even more I'm like I really can't not grow because I'd be an absolute hypocrite if I was like emotional health 2020 and I was like not doing anything to take care of myself so it's been a little bit of an accountability thing for myself I think right well let me let me ask a very obvious question then or it might be obvious to you um for you what have you changed? What are your new healthy practices that you have to be conscious of to do now uh, on a regular basis uh, that we could all apply, I guess is what I'm asking. Oh, that's interesting. Um, well, I'm not sure. I'm not one to say everyone should live their life like me. So it's more like I would encourage everyone to define their own <laughs> version of what I've learned to do. But for me specifically, I started taking antidepressants recently and oh, my gosh, I like truly I, I should think I should have been doing this my whole life kind of thing. But I think the version of do that for yourself would be kind of take away whatever stigma you're you're putting on what you might need to feel best. And either that's, you know, friendships in your life that are actually creating a lot of toxicity for you emotionally, whether that is talking to your therapist about antidepressants, whether that is getting a therapist. I think it's just kind of setting yourself up with tools around you in your day to day that don't require a lot of like work to get mm -hmm. to just to help you feel at home in your body. Cause I think any form of self care that's convincing you, you need something really far outside of yourself is, I, I think it's harmful. So it's just finding ways to help you feel inside of your body. I think like yoga or walking or, drinking water when you think about it. Like it can be so simple. I think right. it's just, it's giving yourself a moment in the day to just feel fully inside and aware of yourself and your body, you know. You mentioned therapy. Has that been an important uh, tool for you? Yes. And I have, it takes a long time to find a good therapist though, uh, but which is great. But I think some people it's hard because it is like, you're like bearing your soul to someone. And then if they're the wrong therapist for you, it feels a little bit exhausting, but I have a really amazing therapist right now who I love. She's great. And I found her on better help, which is an app of all things, which oh, wow. anyway, so I guess I, I have to do that. <laughs> yeah, no, I didn't know about that. Well, let, let me tie that in then to, to this new record, bad vacation, because you know, now you are going to therapy. Now you are actively thinking about these things you know, there uh, is a really harmful school of thought that some music fans have that I've been guilty of, especially when I was younger, that if the musician isn't depressed, then the art isn't good. We know that's bullshit now. Yeah. Um, but I know that's also something from when I talk to other musicians, that's a weight that kind of carries around, you know, almost a fear sometimes of getting better or something like that. Has that ever been the case? Was that part of your journey? Totally, because I was scared that even taking antidepressants would do some weird thing to me creatively where I couldn't write anymore or I couldn't like, and all of my best songs, like the song, or all of quote unquote, my best songs that I felt people really liked were about stuff that really hurt. So I think when I was younger, like I would say more like 18 to like right before Fine But Dying or even in the middle of writing fine but dying I just felt like nobody would find my stuff true if it wasn't just about the bad shit that I was feeling which is crazy I don't know why I thought that but I think I just liked sad music a lot and so I was like I guess people this is what they want from me and I think it's important to make room for the sad feelings at the table but that's not the only feeling like and I think that's where we kind of we're like cutting the story in half. Like you could get to know someone with way more depth if you also know the joy they hold, not just the sorrow. Um, 
Um, and I'm not saying happy. Happiness is different, but I'm talking about like the deep wells of emotions we can hold. Joy and sorrow are, are they're both just as deep and full if you, but it's harder to tap into joy. It's almost more vulnerable. Being sad is like, like a, like a quick way to feel vulnerable in a song, but it's like showing joy is way more right. exposing, <laughs> you right. know? Well, so so how does that uh, how does that turn up on this this new record? Like, do you notice that you're using and I'll, I'll reference therapy again, like tools in real time as you're writing? Like, are are you able to kind of edit as you're going along differently than you had in the past? Well, I w- I don't think so, but I think naturally, as I'm kind of growing emotionally, I start to realize what my songs mean after they're already there almost like with writing bad vacation i wrote that whole record before i was diving into therapy in the way i am now but i as someone now who's you know in sort of like emotional recovery in a way um i'm able to look at these songs and i'm like oh i was tapping into what i'm learning now in therapy before i even had language for it and i think that just shows like as human beings like in our most natural state, we are prone to expand. It's just figuring out how to give yourself those tools so that expansion is healthy and beneficial. Also, Ralphie is looking you straight in the eye. He is, <laughs> God, he's cute. Anyway. We're bonding. We're making the eye contact. We're... <laughs> I, I know the cats can stare straight into our souls for the better and worse. So I, uh, I know what's happening. <laughs> anyway. But... Um, I'll ask a similar question then kind of further down that when you're writing, is there a point now when you have to decide if the song gets swallowed in the darkness, if you allow it to go in that direction or if that song needs to struggle for the light? I mean, it might be way more natural. I might be trying too hard on that one, but is that ever a decision? You know, songs are never decisions if they're right. (laughs) Like I feel like, Well, that might be a bit of a naive statement, but from my experience of writing songs, I, it's, it's just an overflow. It's, Mm -hmm. it's something I can't control the current of. I, I just show up with whatever instrument or whatever page of paper, and I'm just trying to be a vessel for it to flow through. So it's like, if a song's going to be depressing, it's pretty obvious that you can't flip it into a, everything's going to end up fine thing, but also if the song itself is holding light that you might not even be ready to experience yet, you still have to kind of give in to the force of nature that the song is. I, songwriting is a magic trick. I like don't even know how it happens. It just, anyway, I hope that answers. I don't mean to say No, it, 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 it absolutely does. Um, and it makes me more curious about this record too, because outside of, of, of these, you know, outside of the lyrics, outside of the themes that you're hitting on, it also sounds like a musical leap and there are breadcrumbs from the last record, you know, especially when I go back and you're like, Oh, okay. I can see how she gets to here, but I don't know. Does it seem like that, you know, for you being in the moment, I'm just a listener who heard records, you know, two years apart or whatever like that. Uh, I mean, is it, was it that big of a jump for you? What's going on? Because there's a lot more musically happening here. Yeah. It felt like, all of the ideas, all of the touring, all of the music I was discovering through, I've started to call it my second childhood. When I started touring, I felt like I was experiencing what probably most people were experiencing in middle school and high school when they were listening to all these insane bands. And I feel like I started experiencing that when I started touring. But it was like, I've just been collecting and expanding for so long. And this record, I felt like it was one of the first times that as a producer and as a player, I could really dive into all the all the hints of things that I liked about this music I was listening to in the band or the bands we were touring with or just my playing, how much with a guitar I actually knew what I was doing now. It was like I had, I knew what I could do and I was like, oh, I actually know how to get there now rather than have to like, I, I don't know, I just felt very capable. So it's nice that you, <laughs> say that you can hear that because i'm like hell yeah good. <laughs> actually should you know because uh, again um the single bad vacation in itself i mean we're, we're talking a very big sound you know uh, more 
I think in the early part of your career that a lot of folks would have called you a folk artist, indie folk, uh, as it was. <laughs> and, and this is like, this is like, you know, in your face, new wave rock and roll. I mean, it just seems like so far away. Like, what's the learning curve to get to a point like that? I mean, you talk about having, being equipped this time around, but was there anything you had to learn to make these songs like in real time? I don't. I don't know if in real time it felt like just a collection of the last, you know, I guess eight years of living in Nashville, but I guess five years of like really touring, just pushing my, like every time I felt myself musically, sonically, creatively having a ceiling, I was almost obsessive about making sure that I could get rid of it. Like I didn't want to reach a point where if I had this idea sonically or production wise or lyrically, it felt like it was breaking the rules. I wanted to like create a world creative, like creatively and sonically that it's just forever expanding. Like, cause even when people would call me a folk artist, I understand the first record I put out was that, but I'm also like that, who is just one thing anyways? Right. Like I will always be like, you think I'm this? Ugh, which is like how I've been since I was 14, which has been problematic in my life. But I think creatively, that's where I want to live. It's just anytime I feel a ceiling or a wall or something that is starting to concretely put me in some box, I, I just would rather not not be in the box. <laughs> so. Oh my God, is there no ceiling? Right? It makes sense. And it's become, you know, a phrase that we say just around the house at this point. So. Oh, what? Yeah, that's it's that's true. That's crazy and cool. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Eliza, and uh, this record, it's an important record for the year. It's one of the best records that I've heard this year. But beyond that, uh, thank you for what you're doing. Um, because again, all of us, what's the phrase? All of us can do just a little bit, right? Yeah. And we can make a very big change. And I think that's what you're doing right now. You're, you're doing more than a little bit, by the way, but you are making a change out there. That's really nice. Thank you so much. No problem. And uh, again, if people want to follow along, this is on your Instagram. They can search this up with Liza Ann and, uh, and you're calling it uh, Emotional Health 2020. So I'm pretty sure they can search for that as well, right? Yeah, you can search for that. And it's every Tuesday night at 6 Central. Um, okay. No matter where I am, that will be the time. <laughs> 6 Central. <laughs> awesome. And you're going to keep this going? I mean, in, you know, yeah. indefinitely right now? I mean, 2020. You know, just till till I'm tired, which to be honest, I'm always tired. So we'll see. But I think every Tuesday until until whenever. Awesome. So, yeah. We'll be watching. We'll be watching. Cool. Uh, and everybody, if you haven't already, go listen to Bad Vacation. If you haven't heard me complimented enough, you have to go listen to Bad Vacation. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining. Thanks, everybody, for, uh, for checking us out. Also, remember, I'll be back on the air, WFBK at 6 p.m. Eastern. to we'll see you there as well. Liza Ann, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kyle. This was great.